detail and customer protection volume of the latest Acer SEER market monitoring report. My name is Jana Hasova. I'm co-chair of the SEER customer and retail market working group and co-chair of Acer retail working group. It is my pleasure to be a moderator of today's webinar. At the beginning, I would like to provide you with uh, several technical instructions. Um, please note that this webinar is recorded. Uh, of course, uh, you're welcome to ask questions at any time during the webinar, but please in the chat. And if we can ask you uh, to, when you place a question, please be concise and indicate the topic of the question. We will have a Q&A session in the end of the webinar. And we would like to assure you that the slides will be shared with you after the webinar via email or end on the ACER website, including a recording of this webinar. Our aim today is to share with you uh, the key findings and conclusions of the retail and consumer protection volume according to the following agenda. Introductory remarks will be presented by Mrs. Annegret Grebel. Mrs. Annegret Grebel is the president of SHEAR and member of the ASIL Board of Regulators. Key findings from the market monitoring report, the chapter uh, for retail and consumer protection, will be introduced by my colleagues, uh, Mr. Dennis Erdem from SHEAR and Mr. Seamus Byrne from ACER. Dennis and Seamus are co-conveners of the Market Monitoring Task Force. Based on the key findings, I'm going to present to you the report recommendations. This part of the webinar will be followed by responses provided by Mrs. Adela Pesajewa, Head of Unit for Consumers, Just Transition and Local Initiatives from DG Ener, and Mrs. Anna Weidenbach, Policy Officer from Energy Efficiency Unit, also DG Ener. They will share with us what is their view on how these findings relate to future EU policy challenges and priorities. As mentioned in the beginning, there will be a part dedicated to your questions. And finally, section on conclusions will be presented by Mr. Christian Singlerson, the director of ACER. And now I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Annegret Grebel, who will present the introductory remarks. Please, Annegret. Yes, thank you, Jana, for welcoming uh, and starting uh, the uh, presentation here and uh, of the joint uh, ACER CR Consumer and Retail Market uh, Monitoring Report uh, volume. Uh, I think this is uh, the, the, the third in, in the series of market monitoring reports, and it focuses on consumers and retail markets. So finally, the, the, the targets of all our regulatory work uh, on the wholesale markets. Uh, and therefore, it is, of course, uh, the, let's say, the, the ultimate test, so to speak, of the effectiveness of regulation. And uh, there is a broad uh, spectrum that we uh, have gathered uh, that, uh, that of data that, that was gathered in this report and also of the necessary analysis with regard uh, to uh, are the consumers uh, making use of the possibilities to switch? Are consumers informed well so that they can make an informed uh, choice, for example, by uh, price con comparison tools? Do they know? what uh, they have to pay and what what, what they pay for. Is the bill clear enough? Is it transparent? Uh, are there switching barriers? Again, this is something that uh, we need um, to, to analyze and to, to trace. And this is uh, done in this report uh, for the year 2020. And uh, let me stress this, uh, we of course have here the picture of uh, the 2020 extreme situation characterized by a COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which uh, seems uh, with regard to some of the results, for example, the energy prices uh, decreased um, a little bit uh, strange or outdated currently, uh, given the high prices that we see. Uh, but uh, of course, this is uh, uh, um, a, an analysis of what has, has actually happened and how markets uh, worked and uh, what measures were taken. 
uh, and uh, the the results of all this will be presented uh, later, as uh, Jana was saying by herself. Um, and uh, that is what you should bear uh, in mind. Uh, so don't wonder. Uh, this is uh, the picture of the year 2020, uh, and of course there, there is there, there, this is also let's say uh, the picture against uh, which we have to assess also today's development. So uh, that is something that uh, you should bear uh, in mind. And that I wanted uh, to um, to highlight at the beginning, so that you so you are aware of this uh, specific situation. Uh, so uh, this is um, the the question. As I said, we want to look also whether the consumers are more active and make use also of uh, dynamic price contracts. Uh, we highlight also the risks uh, and the challenges, uh, as well as the benefits that can can be drawn from using those. Uh, so we have tried also to make an analysis of the new instruments of the clean energy package here uh, to see uh, in how far they have been implemented and in how far they have actually been used and uh, what we can learn uh, from this uh, in terms of potentially increasing our regulatory efforts uh, to make it work better uh, for the benefit uh, of consumers. So that is also the, let's say, forward-looking perspective. It's not only backward-looking, uh, but of course the, the, the future developments uh, need uh, to be aware of uh, the actual developments. Uh, I think uh, with this, uh, I uh, would hand uh, over then uh, to um, uh, to Dennis uh, to present uh, the uh, results uh, of the report uh, on, on, on this very interesting report on consumer and retail markets. Thanks. Many thanks, Anna Gretman. Thanks, Jana, for the excellent introduction. Uh, I'm Dennis Erdem. I'm working. Uh, and uh, on behalf of CR um, Mark Monitoring Task Force and for the Bundesnetzag in the short presentation uh, with Shimas, we will be displaying some important results from the uh, aforementioned uh, report. Next slide, please. If you look at this year's report, um, you will see that there's a new structure of the report, which can be listed under retail mark structure, conduct of energy consumer suppliers and suppliers and performance of energy retail markets, where we'll be uh, looking at the price developments. And we have some new topics in this year's report. These are all displayed here in green. For example, we look at some environmental related issues, COT and intensity and green as gas emissions or electrical electrical vehicles. Next slide, please. Here in the next slides, we will be uh, showing some selected um, findings from the report. And if you want to understand the structures on the retail markets, uh, it's important to look at marked concentration and marked power of, um, of suppliers. So one finding of these Year's report is that in the majority of member states, there's a reduction of uh, mark concentration, which can be measured by so called HHI index. Um, and um, in general, if you compare household uh, segment with the non household segment, you see that uh, the non household markets are less concentrated. But even though uh, there is a reduction of uh, mark concentration, which is good for the consumer, which is good for the uh, competition on the market. The level, the general level in Europe is still quite high. Next slide, please. Um, if you want to understand the retail markets and the suppliers' activities, uh, of course, one of the uh, indicators is the enter and exit uh, statistics and what we found out is that there are some countries as uh, Italy and Spain uh, where you have uh, a more dynamic uh, activity in terms of the entry and exit uh, to, the, to the retail markets. And we see that in those markets, uh, this development is good for the HHI development for the uh, reduction of concentration levels. But having said that, you cannot always conclude that high and higher number of supplier and consumer 
uh, ratio is consistent with the, with the mark concentration. Um, if you look at the non-household segments, you see that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, only in seven member states, both in electricity and gas, uh, there is a reduction of the number uh, of nationwide suppliers in 2020. Next slide, please. All right. Um, as announced in the beginning, uh, when very interesting, um, very fresh topic is uh, the emissions and the contribution of uh, energy sector uh, to the emissions. And we used our, the uh, data from Eurostat. And what we found out is that the contribution of the energy sector to the greenhouse gas emission um, varies substantially from member state to the member states. And it is, of course, reasonable. Um, due to the uh, intense energy, intense and carbon intensity of different uh, member states. Um, another interesting and new topic from this year's report is the development of electric uh, vehicles. Uh, we selected this issue exemplary uh, as a driver of structural change, and we uh, saw that the uh, electric vehicle rates are currently low in Europe, but there is an increasing trend. And what we see is there, uh, we need more collaboration uh, among networks, suppliers, and consumers. And we believe that smart meters could be a key uh, driver enabler of this collaboration in the future. Next slide, please. Um, as in the past reports, uh, we looked again at the price intervention and uh, the, the mechanisms, price intervention mechanisms in the member states, and we see that in 15 um, countries in electricity and in 14 countries in gas, we still have some form of public price intervention. Uh, on the other hand, uh, five member states for electricity and seven for gas um, have committed to a roadmap uh, for a price intervention removal um, in the future, at least for the household segment. Um, my last slide will be uh, dedicated to the switching rates. Uh, it's something what we measure every year. In general, the best performing member states are almost the same as, as in the past. Um, but in general, probably due to uh, pandemic, there is a decrease in terms of the switching rates. Uh, there is a new element in our report this year which is the comparison uh, exercise of switching rates uh, with consumer perceptions from uh, Commission's new consumer market uh, monitoring survey. Um, and my last um, bullet point is about the, uh, about the consumers uh, which are switching, um, find the process easy but there is still a large proportion of consumers who never uh, switched in the past or assessed even the options available to them. So thank you again uh, for listening. Uh, Shimas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Yana. Um, hi, all. My name is Shimas Bernard. I'm a policy officer within the uh, infrastructure gas and retail department within ACER. Um, so just to kind of run through, Comparison to and so what we can see here in two maps on with electricity and gas. So there's a large. Sorry, Seamus, I, I very badly hear you. Better now. Please try again if that works. Yep. Okay. Um, so just on comparison to us, what we see is there's a large spread of comparison tools across the EU for electricity and gas. These are by confirm current consumers um it was very important that one thing like to know she was, I'm, I'm very sorry there's a really bad bad quality of your sound of your audio i'll see yeah i think i'll see your phone to that better can you hear it all 
Yeah, much better. Please try louder. Okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. I'll continue on this one. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, so on comparison tools, we have a wide spread of comparison tools across member states um, for both electricity and gas. These are vital for empowering consumers. So what you can see is in the purple patches there, you have 10 or more comparison tools in a lot of member states. Um, so while they're, they're available, we have that uh, not all consumers are utilizing them. So as you get the full benefit of, the benefit of them, it's important that consumers start using them and find them easy to use. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so on smart meters, so what we see is the role of the smart meter is actually improving. So all of the light blue uh, here, you can see that the rollout rate has hit about 80%. There are some delays that can be expected here in the future. A lot of this might be down to um, COVID-19, uh, the uh, backlog that that's going to cause. We've got five member states that have um, indicated that they're not going to hit the 80% rollout until after 2024. Seamus, um, I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, we indeed, uh, it's possibly not only me, but but uh, also uh, the participants have troubles to understand uh, what you are saying. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's about uh, the yeah. what's the what's the trouble behind first. So let's have a second try, a third. Better? Super. Much more better. Yeah. Super. Thanks. Apologies again. So sorry. On uh, smart meters, so what we're seeing is that the rollout rate is improving. Uh, so we've got a, we're hitting 80% in a lot of member states. We can expect some delays in some member states. Uh, do you want me to go back from the start, actually, Anna, if no one has actually heard me at all? Yeah, Seamus, I think now it's now it's great. I assume it's it should be okay from from now uh, if everybody uh, agrees. But yeah, I have a, I have a, in the chat. Yes, please, if you could start from your first slide, uh, and it would be uh, better for everybody. So let's have a next try, and thank you. Okay, super. Uh, so on comparison to us, what we see is there's a widespread uh, for electricity and gas um, across the European Union. Look, these are very, very important for empowering, empowering cons uh, consumers. However, they really must know how to utilize them and actually know that they exist in the first place. So what we have is um, not all consumers are using these. So, um, but when we do, what we do see is when the consumers do use them, the vast majority of them actually find them quite easy to use and it really helps them in their switching process. Next slide, please. Uh, smart meter rollout. So as touched on there, uh, the rollout rate is improving. We're at 80% um, in a lot of member states. There are some delays that will be expected as part of because of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Five member states have outlined that um, they won't hit the 80% rollout rate until after 2024. We do have limited uh, rollout of smart meters in the gas sector. Um, and then you can see that there's still a lot of member states where rollout of smart meters is below 50%. So that means a lot of consumers in those member states are actually not getting access to um, real-time information and that can enable them and inform them of their actual energy consumption and uh, what price they're paying. Next slide, please on active consumers. So we have electricity dynamic offers, real-time pricing, and more advanced services, but these are still limited. These are very much linked to the availability of smart meters above. For solar PV panels um, among householders, the usage is still low. Um, cost is a barrier here in some instances and others. Uh, regulatory arrangements can really uh, be a bit of a burden to some consumers. Uh, the selling of excessive en energy is available in a lot in 21 member states with aggregators aggregators available in 19 member states signaling like future opportunities are available here for energy consumers regarding citizen energy communities we still have limited statistical coverage um, but we do have a lot of interest that has been signaled uh, next slide please on the bills which anna Gret, uh, touched on at the start so there's a lot of information that has been included in the energy bills um, so you can see in the light blue a lot of consumers receive more than 15 items of information. 
price and volume are the most important pieces of information and these are included in most countries. However, what we do see is that switching and comparison information is not included in a lot of bills. Um, we also see some shortcomings on fuel mix, um, environmental impact and energy consumption, um, and also like uh, dispute resolution. How, if a consumer has a problem, how do they address that? We also see that some bills are quite lengthy this can be maybe uh, result in compl additional complexity for consumers and can it really inhibit them um, if they want to partake in a kind of uh, being, being more active in their consumption and actually their energy bills. Next slide, please. Uh, so on the breakdown, moving to the prices. So what we see is we see a kind of a, a transition over the last few years from 2012 to 2020. So we see the energy component is actually decreasing in both electricity and gas with a slight increase in network uh, network components. If you look at electricity, you can see that the res charge component has really increased in, um, over the last coming years, and that has resulted in more renewables being uh, pushed onto the, onto the electricity systems. Uh, next slide. On to energy prices. So as Anna Great outlined at the start, um, due to COVID, we did see an increase in um, energy prices last year, but now we're seeing kind of a different story right now at present. Um, so there was a slight decrease in 2020. Uh, these were the second pri highest prices we recorded since 2008, and we're looking at a 30% increase in nominal terms since that time. Um, gas prices also decreased, um, but then the uh, price increase wasn't as much since 2010. We do see large variations. Um, where we see that German household consumers, they were paying three times that of the con uh, household consumers in Belgium. And then when you look at gas, we also see uh, variations across the board. So in Sweden, you had 10.3 cents being paid in comparison to laughing consumers who were paying uh, three cent. Next slide. So on the markups, which is just basically an assessment of the uh, wholesale and retail energy component only, we see that the this component regularly weakens when the wholesale prices actually decrease. So we see kind of a, a widening between the green and the blue bars and the red and the orange bars. Um, basically what that indicates is that the retail price doesn't track as easy, as quickly as it does with the wholesale prices signaling that sometimes those consumers can pay a little bit more. So what we do see this year or last year was we observed some negative markups in electricity in Hungary and Poland. Uh, and then in gas, we observed some negative markups in Romania and Hungary. Next slide, please. On energy uh, poverty and vulnerable consumers. So last year we saw no major changes in supplier of last resort, concepts of vulnerable consumers, and I'll say general uh, safeguards for consumer protection. We did see um, COVID-19 resulting in large reductions in disconnection rates, and there were measures implemented by the members, uh, by the NRAs uh, to protect consumers in response to the impact caused by COVID-19. We're seeing some slow progress um, in defining and measuring energy poverty. It's, it is continuing to improve, but there are more improvements needed here. And in general, we would say that ge uh, general welfare uh, is much, much better than energy specific sake for to protect these two cohorts of consumers. Next slide. Uh, finally then, on complaints. So we see a lot of complaints that are issued by consumers uh, across the board um, each year. We see key focus on uh, billing, tariffs that are paid, switching. Um, one issue we'd probably highlight is that uh, some NRAs don't actually split out the, the complaint data. So you get suppliers and uh, distribution system operator complaints being actually merged together. So this may, makes it a little bit difficult to actually identify what the key issue is. So we'd suggest uh, uh, splitting those out in coming years. Um, that's my last slide. So Jan, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, I hope it's uh, apologies for the sound issues. Yeah, many thanks uh, to you both, uh, to Dennis and Seamus. Uh, we have tech board, uh, and the, the troubles with the audio um, so we can also now continue. Uh, so now let me continue by presenting the report recommendations. So we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So to begin with, um, um, or it was uh, already mentioned previously, on average uh, energy retail prices decreased in 2020. The decrease was largely driven by wholesale electricity and gas price decreases. Uh, caused by the significant reduction in both electricity and gas demand during the COVID-19 pandemics. However, um, as it's mentioned, there has been a significant rebound in energy demand, which is resulting in significantly higher prices for energy consumers in 2021. 
Um, the timing and impact of wholesale price increases on consumers' bills depends on their contracts for energy services. That means whether they are flexible, dynamic, or fixed price contracts. Um, what consumer can save? They can save, have saving opportunities available between uh, 200 and 300 uh, uh, euros per annum by switching. And for being, being uh, switching helpful, uh, comparison tools can be used uh, to, for, uh, for, can be used by consumers to find an alternative supplier. So, therefore, NRAs should ensure that all consumers have access to and are aware of comparison tools. Uh, it's obvious that the benefits of comparison tools have yet to be fully utilized. We can move to the next slide so that the conclusion continues. Uh, yeah, energy efficiency will be key to protect consumers uh, from energy price increases during the transition and member states must ensure its implementation. Importantly, renewables have become a larger part of the generation mix, uh, accounting for more than 50% of total electricity generation in some markets. In general, uh, European energy con uh, consumers on average had a broader supplier choice in 2020 than in the year before. As it was uh, already mentioned on the slides presented by Dennis, the market concentration levels, so called HHA, in 16 of 25 electricity markets remained high above 2000, indicating that consumer choice, in fact, was limited in many markets. For non households markets, well, the, the concentration lower, but the concentration levels still show room for improvement. We can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Major electrification foreseen in sectors is expected to impact both the demand and supply sides of the economy. Uh, it's, it's obvious and was also presented um, by Seamus on his slides that the uptake of electric vehicles will increase as the transportation sector decarbonizes. And in the race, there should be cognizant of the interaction electric vehicles will have with distribution system and consider incentivize recharging outside of peak demand periods. And now we are also aiming at a point, bullet point address to dynamic prices, where dynamic electricity price offers, real-time pricing and other more advanced services are still limited across the EU. Uh, of course, dynamic uh, offers can bring benefits to both the consumers and the system. And consumers should be fully informed of the potential benefits, but not only of the benefits, but also of the potential downsides to such contracts. It was stated in the report that in 11 member states, electricity consumers can choose real-time or hourly energy pricing. Thank you. Uh, in conclusions, based on our uh, uh, next bullet point, the selling excess energy and the existence of aggregators are relatively new concepts and may be complex to consumers. So to encourage uptake among consumers, the process of selling excess energy and utilizing aggregators should be a relatively easy process to engage with. What is important is that a clear bill enables consumer understanding of their energy use. Importantly, it should not be overloaded with information. That means that uh, the customer need not to have a degree in energy to understand his own bill. Also, the European energy consumer filed millions of complaints to their suppliers and distribution system operators across the European Union each year. The data collection should be improved, so issues they are clearly understood. Uh, it was stated uh, also that from the data from the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub that shows that energy poverty is closely linked to overall income poverty, highlighting the multidimensional nature of energy poverty. If I may ask for the next slide. Yes, indeed, uh, 2020 and 2021 are extreme price years, which are linked to some extent. They might teach us three important lessons. First one, 
In extreme situations, extraordinary measures are needed to shield vulnerable parts of the population from unexpected economic impacts. Secondly, careful balance to be struck between protecting vulnerable groups against dramatic price rises, whilst enabling price signals to encourage efficient consumption. And the third part is on the dynamic prices already mentioned. Dynamic price contracts can offer significant benefits, as it was said, for individual customers and for the wider energy system. On the other hand, they increase consumers' exposure to wholesale price volatility, which needs to be recognized. So the balance of risk placed on consumers versus suppliers should be examined. So thank you. That's all for uh, my part now <laughs> presenting. And after presenting those recommendations, I would uh, now raise a question on how do these findings relate to future EU policy challenges and priorities? At this moment, it's my pleasure to welcome you, uh, Adela, uh, Mrs. Adela Tesarjeva, and also Mrs. Uh, Anne Weidenbach. And uh, ladies, if I may ask you to take the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And many thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, I, as, um, well, I represent the unit NRB1, uh, which is responsible for uh, energy consumers and for just transition. Um, so we are a, a very active customer of this report. And also I would like to thank my colleague Dina Filiu, who actually was coordinating the commission consultation and um, you know, and any comments that we have provided uh, in this in this work. And we very much, uh, very much welcome this report. Um, maybe to just to say uh, a few words about the unit because we are a new unit and we are uh, to some extent re-establishing contacts. Um, so we are responsible for energy, uh, for for protection of consumers and for empowerment of consumers. Um, so very much the subjects covered by this report. Uh, as you know, a big topic for this year is the transposition check of the electricity directive. While at the same time, the Commission is um, expanding the consumer protection and empowerment provisions across the other pieces of legislation with the Fit for 55 package. We had already uh, proposed um, provisions uh, in the energy efficiency directive uh, and and uh, what is next uh, is uh, is the um, decarbonization of gas package uh, plus the uh, uh, EPBD review um, so that's the important legislative work currently going on um, in addition uh, we also work on smart metering uh, many of you are involved in the work on the implementing act on, on data and interoperability um, and we also uh, run the smart uh, smart grids task force and we are actually currently considering whether we should also activate the expert group three which would allow us uh, to engage on, on other topics um, of course linked to digitalization but also of other consumer concern um, and of course this year has been a specific year um, as as you mentioned from from the COVID pandemic we have moved uh, to to post COVID recovery uh, we have uh, we are facing high energy prices so there are um, a lot of of course a lot which is currently being done at the member states level uh, but um, as you are very aware the commission works very closely with Acer um, on uh, looking at what's happening in the energy markets and we are very happy to also of course continue uh, working on the consumer aspects um, here I would like to flag two new initiatives um, one is the setting up of an expert group on, uh, on energy poverty and vulnerable customers, which will be an expert group with member states, but we expect that there will be also a role for national regulators and for ACER. And, and the second is, um, is a new initiative, which we are considering to start next year with a broad uh, consultation, uh, which would be to look at the cross-border retail markets. So this is all follow up uh, to uh, to the uh, toolbox that the Commission presented in uh, in October. So coming back to your report, and again, many thanks to Acer and to national regulators for uh, preparing it. For us, it's a, uh, an impressive source of information and data. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, we are very grateful for this, and uh, we are very grateful to continue working with you because indeed the report shows that the consumer protection and empowerment we are not yet there. And um, on all the aspects, uh, you know, being it uh, being it switching, being it rollout of smart meters, a new uh, availability of offers, uh, regulated prices, um, uh, or smart metering, uh, 
there is much more uh, that can be done. Uh, we are also looking um, a bit into the question what really drives consumers. And um, we hope that we will have a good debate on this at the, next, at the Dublin Forum this year. Um, so there is a lot going on in this area. And we are very happy to continue working with you. And I actually also suggested that we meet bilaterally to have a look at this report and the findings a bit more in detail and to also discuss with you you know where this is going we uh, we very much welcome uh, the new additions that have been added um and of course next year will be a special year also because we will we will know uh, where are we with the transposition check of the electricity directive um so there is a lot happening and uh, so i hope we will have a possibility to meet with you bilaterally and discuss uh, the next edition and how we can um, make it even more relevant for for the policy making in the eu but thank you very much again for this excellent report and um, yeah, as I said, we are very happy customers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Adela, for your uh, kind words. We really appreciate the collaboration and looking forward for the upcoming uh, issues we will have on our to-do list, to say. And many thanks. Uh, and uh, if I may ask uh, Anne, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are slides uh, from Anne to be presented. Yes, please. I shared the uh, slides with uh, Shimon. Maybe you could show them. I think they're included, so yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Adela, for passing uh, the word to me. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to, to attend this meeting. Also, from, from my background, um, I know uh, many, many names on the uh, list. Uh, I just detected it. Some uh, former colleagues uh, are there. Um, as Adela pointed out, um, we work closely together on consumer related issues with uh, Adela in the lead um, in, in um, her unit. Uh, we are focusing more on, um, on uh, also other aspects of energy efficiency. And uh, in this regard, I would also like to congratulate you to um, the report and also the recommendation and findings you just uh, uh, presented. You would see it's uh, also important for our work in our unit, so it's the energy efficiency uh, unit, um, because what we uh, aim uh, at is to uh, promote energy efficiency, which means um, to ach achieve a, um, a state of play that uh, consumers can really claim that the energy that they do not use is the cheapest uh, one. But this also requires, and this is uh, one of your recommendations, that consumers are empowered and protected that they know which energy they consume, um, how much energy they consume um, and how much it costs. And there is also um, in the current energy efficiency directive, uh, there are plenty of uh, provisions, uh, for example, the smart, uh, the rollout of uh, smart meters, it's still in the energy efficiency directive or provisions on smart metering and billing for uh, heating and cooling and domestic hot water, but also the role of uh, uh, national regulatory authorities uh, regarding the network development planning, which also requires there in Article 15 to that uh, NRAs assess and consider the role of energy efficiency and require TSOs uh, to, to pay attention when they develop their networks. But maybe with the first slide, uh, I would like to move there. So uh, with the with the fit for 55 package, maybe you will um, uh, already already find an echo on your recommendations uh, that we really need to to make sure that we have an energy transition which is inclusive or fair, cost efficient and competitive, uh, which also means that uh, consumers know um, uh, can can really benefit from the multiple benefits also from energy efficiency. Um, so next slide, please. In, in that package um, and also in the European Green Deal communication, uh, energy efficiency has been identified uh, as one of the priorities or, uh, or is key for a, a clean transition because um, in the climate target plan, it has been assessed that decarbonization or full decarbonization cannot, be, uh, cannot happen or cannot be achieved without energy efficiency. Um, because it's really a, a question of, um, of cost effectiveness. So next slide, please. 
So what were the objectives of the energy efficiency um, directive revision? It's uh, in, in the climate target plan, which was the starting point for uh, our assessment. Um, it has been identified that there are a lot of energy savings um, across the economy, but also uh, on household level, and that um, energy efficiency or further energy efficiency improvements are needed to contribute to uh, the decarbonization target in 2030 or full decarbonization by 2050. And the aim is really to provide member states with uh, with measures which are compatible with these requirements, which also uh, which also relate a lot to consumer protection and empowerment. Next slide, please. So, what are the the main elements? Um, it's uh, we we proposed a binding energy efficiency target. It's already existing, but uh, the the difference is now that it's binding at EU level and that member states need to uh, set up indicative, so non-binding national contributions. And the aim is by 2030 that the energy consumption is at least reduced by uh, 9%. Then one important um, point, which is important for NRAs, but also for consumers, is um, the energy efficiency first principle, which means to consider uh, energy efficiency improvement measures always as a first um, alternative. For example, if um, if you are working on a network development, uh, if um, enlargement of the network is needed, or if you can have uh, smart technologies implemented, which can decrease the demand. Then we have a strengthened energy savings obligation. Um, member states are now required to achieve 0.8% of new energy savings per year. The, the idea is now that it's increased the savings rate by 1.5% each year as from uh, 1st of January 2024. There's also um, a need to um, address one important sector, which is the public sector. And um, I think this is also um, echoing what you said about uh, energy um, poverty. Um, we have an increased focus on the need to alleviate energy poverty uh, and also to uh, empower consumers uh, in a better way. Next slide, please. Um, which what is very much related also uh, to, to um, the direct impact on, um, on customers or um, households is energy efficiency in heating and cooling. The time does not allow to spend um, to explain it um, in, uh, intensely, but I just want to focus on on one important point that the um, energy efficiency directive uh, propose um, a revised definition of what can be considered as efficient heating, uh, district heating and cooling, um, and there are also um, better planning and comprehensive assessments are needed. Next slide, please. This might be uh, of, of your interest uh, as um, you are uh, representing the national regulatory authorities. So the idea is uh, in, in one article, Article 25, uh, to require um, a thorough uh, application of the energy efficiency first principle. The principle itself is not new. It was uh, already uh, established in the governance regulation. There was a definition. But um, uh, the Commission identified the need to ensure a better uh, application of this principle, which means um, to not only apply it in, in uh, the energy world, but also in, in non-energy sectors. And there also um, member states would be required to assess energy efficiency um, alternatives um, if it uh, relates to consumer protection and also um, the alleviation of, of energy uh, poverty. In, um, in this regard, NRAs should provide methodologies and uh, guidance on how, for example, distribute uh, DSOs or TSOs um, can apply this principle so that it's a, a cost-benefit analysis that energy efficiency is considered there. And the idea is also um, to, to um, um, uh, to ensure uh, price stability by um, avoiding network losses. So this is also one uh, one aim of, of that article. Next slide, please. 
as you also identified and recommend in, in your report, um, it's very much about consumer empowerment and information. You will find in the, the proposal for revised energy efficiency directive also the introduction of basic contractual rights for heating, cooling, domestic hot water, which, for example, are um, which consumers and final users uh, can understand, which is uh, accessible, um, and also the establishment of uh, one stop shops uh, for. Um, or out of court um, uh, um, mechanisms um, are uh, provided there. It, it's really important, as you also identified, that consumers uh, receive information which is uh, transparent and that everyone knows who the supplier is, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is my, my last slide. Um, also, one particular focus is uh, strengthening the rules for um, the protection of vulnerable consumers. So, um, member states would be required to prioritize energy efficiency measures um, for the, um, and let energy poor and vulnerable households benefit from it. Um, it's, it's also um, the possibility for member states to require TSOs and GSOs um, to, to um, to pay um, money to a dedicated national energy efficiency fund where uh, member states can make use of to promote uh, energy efficiency among uh, households. And um, uh, it's also a requirement that member states uh, shall make best possible use of public funding also for supporting uh, energy efficiency. And why, why is it so important? As you said, it's, uh, it's about um, knowing how much uh, energy uh, you, um, you consume, but it's also to, to raise awareness of, of consumers. And that's why um, the priority of energy efficiency also in this regard is very, very important. And with this, sorry for, for running through the slides, but I thought it, it might be good for, for, for uh, discussions today or also bilaterals, as Adela also pointed out later on. If there are further questions uh, from, from um, you colleagues, don't hesitate to contact um, Adela and also me uh, for, for further explanation. But thanks a lot for your attention. Many, many thanks, Anne. Uh, it is uh, clearly and obviously uh, that there uh, is a lot of work behind and uh, because lack of time, I will go slight, uh, go, go directly to the questions. And um, uh, I have here a question from the audience from Jose Gabriel uh, Luis Cordova. Uh, it relates your last slide indeed uh, on, on uh, energy poverty and vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability, if I may pass that to you. Uh, and the question is, uh, which protection mechanism does the EU uh, implement for tackling energy poverty and vulnerability? Uh, it was already mentioned in the slide, but if you could uh, shortly uh, intervene. I, maybe I think I should take this question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wanted to say maybe it's uh, Adela who should start first. Yes. So in general terms, energy poverty and vulnerability are defined in EU legislation. We have them in the electricity directive, uh, in the governance uh, regulation, now in the energy efficiency directive, and uh, we are now reviewing the gas directive. Um, so that's the legislative framework. And within this legislative framework, we have uh, proposed a definition of energy poverty in the energy, energy efficiency directive this summer. When it comes to vulnerability, um, it's up to member states how they define vulnerable customers. Um, the Commission has issued a recommendation on energy poverty last year to provide some policy guidance to member states, and member states were expected to report on energy poverty in their national energy and climate plans. Um, and then uh, to provide some additional support uh, for tackling energy poverty uh, this summer, uh, the Commission proposed a social climate fund, which would be specifically uh, focusing on helping uh, to finance energy efficiency improvements and green transport solutions for energy poor and other types of vulnerable households. So I think that would be in a nutshell the framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adela, for your uh, response to that. Uh, given the, the time uh, troubles we, we are now facing, um, uh, we have only a few minutes left for, for the Q&A section, uh, uh, which is a pity, but uh, of course we can uh, continue uh, bilaterally or also then at the Dublin Forum. Uh, I can now recall the first uh, question we received in the chat, 
before uh, and and try to gain the response. Uh, there is a question from from uh, Richard Nielsen. Uh, is the five and seven countries indicated to remove or a price intervention intervention among those few uh, EU member states that still uh, maintain regulated uh, power and or gas prices. I will pass because it relates to the, the report. I will pass shortly to my colleagues Seamus and then after I uh, due to the lack of time to to uh, Christian Singler. Seamus, if I can ask you. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so basically any of the member states that have uh, committed to removing ones are the ones that have um, uh, intervention in place. We haven't received a commitment though from all uh, member states that have uh, intervention in place yet, so there are still some that, some that have not committed to re removal. Many thanks, uh, Seamus. And now, finally, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Christian, uh, Singlerson, whether he is connected. I am connected. Let me just check whether you hear me, Jana. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Perfect. We can see you. We can hear you. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and thanks for allowing me to take the floor uh, here at the very end. I think there would be a substantial uh, amount of questionings, uh, questions as well. But as you said, Jana, they, they might be able to be tackled in a different format. Well, we have to close in a second. So I'd like to close us out. Um, uh, thanking first uh, colleagues at CIA, uh, kicking off with Anna Gret in the beginning and the rest of you, uh, also my colleagues at Acer, uh, Shemis, Dennis uh, and others and the different contributors to a, uh, yeah, this merged volume, a truly collaborative effort. And I would have three main uh, messages, perhaps contributions here, uh, closing out today's webinar. Um, the first is picking up on some of the introductory items. Uh, I think it is uh, key. Uh, I think we all recognize it's key that consumers have not only the tools, but the information available to be able to make informed choices. And if they so choose to participate actively in what will be a much more dynamic type of energy system moving forward. Part of that is the smart meter rollout on the hardware side. Part of it is uh, frameworks around comparison tools and ease of reference uh, for making such choices. And I would add to that in the current context, perhaps at political level, attention has shifted slightly towards, shall we say, more shielding from uh, excessive uh, price, perceived excessive price volatility levels. That is, of course, very legitimate, but one of, perhaps should also recognize that the current energy context, energy price context is quite unique. Uh, and so not necessarily this would be the primary focus in times of less excessive prices. And so we should keep uh, a close eye on the tools and availability of information also for those times uh, when the current excessive price levels uh, will decrease. My second message is to welcome uh, our colleagues from the European Commission and um, their contributions in terms of couching some of these findings and recommendations within the broader picture of uh, the energy transition, which is being uh, driven forward. And I think it's quite useful actually to couch some of these efforts and perspectives in the context of wider energy efficiency efforts. I think that is a good motivational boost to what regulators uh, work on. So I welcome that very much. And thirdly, and finally, um, I, maybe I would uh, close by something which is very topical and has been touched upon uh, on uh, multiple occasions over the last hour. Um, that is the somewhat, shall we say, volatile energy price, volatile time that we live in. And indeed, I think these last two years of 2020 and 2021, given that they're quite extreme years in terms of impacts on price, uh, price volatility, can to some extent be rather instructive. It is sometimes when you really, you know, expand a rubber band that you find insights uh, and possible lessons for the future uh, when things are somewhat, shall we say, closer to normal. So I think there are important lessons for us perhaps to look at in instructive times these past two years, very different times. Um, and here I would say that uh, recently we put forward as ACER some analysis and also some select policy considerations from this period in a note that we issued at the same time as the Commission's so-called toolbox on the 13th of October. Um, and I'd uh, do a small plug for the fact that here on Monday we plan to do a bit of a follow-up uh, type of analysis, the so-called preliminary assessment, which the Commission tasked us to do in their toolbox communication. Just a few thoughts on that. Um, I think we would all recognize in situations of 
rather extreme or perceived excessive uh, prices, uh, there is very much um, a case for extraordinary measures to shield those that are most vulnerable uh, in such times. And secondly, I think we would also recognize that there is a balance out there, maybe a dilemma to strike somehow between this need to shield or to cushion and at the same time to keep some sort of price signals to drive desired behavior down the line. Could be efficiency, for what our commission colleagues were pointing to, or to drive new investment in those areas which are deemed most appropriate. Some of that relates around the issue of dynamic price contracting. I think, Shemus, you may have uh, touched upon this as well. Uh, and they can obviously, or um, was it you, Jana, can offer significant benefit, I think it was you, yeah, for the individual uh, consumer, uh, which should not be left off the table. On the other hand, of course, they also increase uh, price risk exposure to some extent. So there is a balance and very much an informational effort uh, necessary to make sure that the consumers uh, are well aware of the choices that they make and the benefits and perhaps also drawbacks with those choices. And lastly, I think also the current situation in several jurisdictions across Europe uh, underlines the value of having these supplier of last resort type mechanisms and making sure they, uh, they function broadly well. So all in all, I think there is a lot to offer from this uh, volume uh, of this year and, and indeed these, this year, which is the main focus of the volume combined with the current year that we now live in, which will be the main focus of next year's volume, uh, are probably instructive because they touch upon two, dare I say, rather extreme situations also impacting consumers uh, across Europe. Thanks a lot, Jana. Uh, that's what I would uh, like to ask. And I could say I look forward to meeting you and colleagues tomorrow in Prague, <laughs> as it were. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Christian, uh, for your concluding remarks, um, summarizing um, that the current situation and, of course, the report uh, of 2020. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me now uh, thank to all the speakers. Thank you all for your participation. And please let me terminate today's webinar. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Wishing you a nice day. And Christian, see you tomorrow in Prague. Indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.